The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from safedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by Crowd Health. Crowd Health is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. Crowd Health is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. Crowd Health holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for Crowd Health and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Andy Schoonover, who is the founder and CEO of CrowdHealth, a community-powered alternative to health insurance that provides a revolutionary way of paying for healthcare bills through crowdfunding. Schoonover was previously CEO of VRI, a healthcare technology company focused on monitoring patients with chronic conditions out of their homes. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia and Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Uh, if you've noticed in the pre-read of this episode, Crowd Health is also now the main sponsor of this podcast, and I've joined them myself. I've spent quite a bit of time uh, grilling Andy on their model, <laughs> and it has my seal of approval. I have... Uh, put my family's healthcare plan now in uh, their hands. So uh, we are very happy to have Andy here today to tell us more and to have the rest of the seminar attendees uh, grill him on this, uh, what I think is a truly, truly innovative and interesting uh, way of approaching healthcare because I think um, it leverages the power of Bitcoin 
in mm. uh, into really getting around all of the fiat aspects of modern health insurance, which are what is making it, uh, what is making health insurance today such a uh, major problem everywhere in the world. Healthcare costs are extremely high, and health insurance is extremely expensive. And dealing with the bureaucracy of health insurance is the stuff of nightmares. Everybody knows somebody who's got a horror story about dealing with insurance. So Andy's trying to fix this. And of course, he's using Bitcoin, the tool that fixes all of those things. So Andy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. I think you just recently had your own little hospital visit too, right? Like a couple stitches at five grand a pop or something crazy like that? <laughs> yes, exactly. My son uh, had to get two stitches and uh, the bill was about $5,000 for two stitches. It's absolutely amazing. Um, Incredible. I've, uh, you know, I've uh, <laughs> made a bit of a name on uh, Twitter for myself. You know, my most viral tweet, uh, you know, I've been tweeting about Bitcoin for so long, and yet my most viral tweet, the most popular tweet that I ever made, was about Canadian healthcare. Um, I was in Canada, and uh, I tried to get my daughter into a hospital once, and just uh, having to wait for hours and hours and hours. Uh, in an emergency room where you can't pay, you can't see anyone, there's no doctor anywhere. And, uh, you know, the because it's free, you have all these uh, drug addicts who come and hang out in the emergency room, spend a day waiting in line uh, so that they can get their free drugs. And that's the only alternative for anybody to get to see a doctor in the case of an emergency. And of course, you know, if you have to see a specialist, you need to wait many months and years. As a relative of mine waited for three years to see a specialist. And so I made a twi tweet about that on Canada, on Canadian healthcare, and it became really viral. Um, and then I got to experience the joys of American healthcare. And of course, I think the really ridiculous thing is that a lot of, for a lot of Americans and Canadians, they think these are the only two... <laughs> <laughs> realities mm -hmm. possible. You know, you either have a communist system like Canada where you need to spend 18 hours bleeding next to drug addicts in order to get a stitch, but then you get it for free and so you're happy about it because it's free, but of course you're paying half of your income in taxes. Or the alternative is we have a free market system like the US, which is what people think the US healthcare system is, where yeah, it's $5,000 for two stitches. You know, a doctor spent 20 minutes stitching a child and somehow... <laughs> The little bit of string and the, his time is worth $5,000. But I dare to say there are alternatives to these kind of uh, <laughs> methods of approaching healthcare. And, I, and you at CrowdHealth are, uh, I think, pioneers in that. So tell us more about what is... Well, before we begin with CrowdHealth, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into the healthcare business and your previous startup and how it led you to CrowdHealth. Yeah, you know it's a it's a funny story. I was uh, I was out at Stanford um, in two thousand and let's see two thousand and four through two thousand and six. And back in those days, it was it was the time where most people um, have seen that movie, The Social Network, where you know about Facebook. And so there's a, a subplot in The Social Network about uh, Eduardo, who's the co-founder of Facebook, with Zuckerberg going f to his dad to look for sixteen thousand dollars to pay these guys in Silicon Valley to. Uh, to rent their house from them. Um, and so, you know, Zuckerberg moved his, moved his group from Boston to Silicon Valley. They rented this house. They actually rented that house from me. Um, and so oh. I, so there's, you know, there's this moment in the, the, the movie where they're, I think, zip lining off the, the, uh, the chimney into the pool or things like that. Well, that, that was actually, you know, my house, they Zuckerberg handed my roommate, you know, 16, I think it was, think it was $16,000 check. So, it was just a crazy time out there. You know, you, you'd see Steve Jobs, you know, walking down, you know, Palo Alto, you, you know, Andy Grove was one of our, who's the founder of Intel was one of our professors. Like it was just a crazy time out at Stanford. Um, and so I thought I was going to do something entrepreneurial, but actually what I ended up doing was uh, buying a little company and of all places, Dayton, Ohio. Um, so all my Silicon Valley friends were like, man, you're going from San Francisco to Dayton, Ohio. And, and so bought a little company. We had, uh, you know, 20 employees that did the I fallen and I can't get up button. So um, if you've been around the States for any period of time, you've seen this, this silly co commercial where it's this old lady sitting on the ground, pressing a button and she's like, I'm falling and I can't get up. Um, and so I, I owned a company that was a competitor of theirs. And then turn that company into realizing that this woman's already on the ground. So we're actually being reactive. 
What if we put a Bluetooth module in that little device that we can monitor her blood pressure and her blood sugars and her weight and all these things to be more proactive and keep her from falling on the ground? And so we built that company from, I don't know, a couple dozen employees to, I think it was 350 or 400 or something like that when we sold it six and a half years later. So that was a, a fun, fun run. And I, I swore I was never going to be in healthcare again, but here I am. Um, came off that, you know, most of us in the United States have, an, have our insurance to our employer. And since I, I, uh, I sold my company, I transitioned out. I didn't have health insurance. And so I, I don't know, naively or ignorantly or whatever, you know, went to healthcare.gov and got my my insurance off of healthcare.gov. So it was like 1200 bucks for me, my wife, and my two girls. And um, I joke, it worked until I had to use it. My my little one, my little one was having recurring ear infections. And so we went to the ear, nose, and throat doc who said she's got a, a, a perforated eardrum. And so she needed to get that fixed. And so we went to the local hospital, got it fixed. It was a 15 minute procedure. I think we were in the hospital a total of 45 minutes, got the bill and it was $8,000. And I'm just like, holy crap, $8,000 for you know a 15 minute procedure. And it was almost as bad safe as your you know, five grand for the two, you know, two stitches, right? I was like, all right, well, this is what health insurance is for. Well, I got a, a note in the mail about three, two or three weeks later that said it was medically unnecessary. And so they weren't going to pay for it. So I went through like two appeals process and ultimately I had to stroke an $8,000 check to the local hospital. Um, and I was pissed. And so I, qu- I quit health insurance. I, my, my, me and my family, so me, my wife, and my two girls have been uninsured for the last about two and a half years have built some tools to allow us to operate outside of legacy health insurance. And, and the culmination of that has been, been crowd health. So in essence, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, you don't need health insurance to survive and you can viably pay your bills in an alternative way. Let's give, give you tools to, to do that. So that's what we've, uh, we've built over the last couple of years. Nice. And so the idea really is... Uh... It's different from the approach that modern health insurance companies take in many distinct ways. How is it really different? Yeah, so I think people, when they ask me, like, why um, the United States is is so expensive, you know, why do we spend twice as much of our GDP on healthcare as any other you know country on the planet? And you know, there's two primary reasons. One is um, obesity. Um, we have twice the amount of obese people in the United States per capita as other uh, similar countries throughout the, throughout the world. And if you are obese, you take two to three times X, the amount of healthcare resources than someone who's not obese. So we have an obesity problem in this, in this country. And I I think it's somewhere between 600 billion and 800 billion of our 4 trillion healthcare spend is on obesity specifically. And then the second second issue is is price, right? We are paying twice as much on average for the same service that you would get in any other country. So we've got obesity, you know, they're taking twice as much the amount of resources, they're paying twice as much for those resources, and we have everybody else paying twice as much. And so those are the two kind of primary drivers of, of why healthcare is, is so expensive. What it is not is consumption. So we, on average, consume about the same amount of healthcare as a whole as other similar countries throughout the throughout the world. So, you know, if you think about that, right? If we have twice the number of obese people, they're spending twice as much to three times as much, cons- consuming twice to three times as much. Um, yet, as a whole, we're on average. That means the people who are not obese are actually consuming less healthcare units per capita than other countries out there. So we actually do okay on on the the consumption piece of this. So that's kind of the obesity. And then on the price, it's like, we've got a system set up here where the health insurance plan actually has an incentive to see prices go up. So um, Obamacare, which you know came into law, I think 12 or 13 years ago or something like that, um, basically said that health insurance plans can profit a maximum of 15% of premiums. So if I have a thousand dollar premium, I can max out at one hundred and fifty dollars of profit. And so everybody in the government thought that was beautiful because we don't want health insurance, you know, plans profiting off of us. The problem with that is these are all for profit entities. And so how do they increase profit? 
they have to have premiums go up. So if you can make $150 on a $1,000 premium, how do you make 165? You have to increase premiums. So they actually have an incentive. Our, our agent, you know, who's supposed to be buying on our behalf, actually has an incentive to see our prices go up. <laughs> and so, you know, you have the buyer of healthcare and the seller of healthcare both wanting that price to go up and the price is going to go up, right? I mean, those are the primary big drivers of why healthcare is so expensive in our country. And I just said that in probably five minutes. It's not as complex as everybody wants you to think it is, although it's a complex system. The reasons why healthcare is so much higher than in the United States and other places are primarily driven by those those two variables. Yeah. The, the idea that you mentioned, which is that insurance companies have an incentive in raising the premiums, I think is truly, uh, truly important to understanding the dysfunction here. And as I was joking earlier, you know, people think of the U.S. healthcare system as being a free market healthcare system, but it is anything but. And in the fiat standard, I did not get into healthcare because I think it's uh, the book had to <laughs> be finished somewhere. And I could probably write a whole other book on the economics of healthcare, and it required um, a lot more research and a, 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 a lot more pages as well. It wouldn't have been uh, really doable inside this other book, in, inside the fiat standard. But the same uh, mechanism that exists with academic research, I think, is true to an extent in um, healthcare. So in the fiat standard, I explain how the universities need their professors to get published in the journals in order to promote them and in order to show that they're getting high impact publications and that they're doing consequential research and so that they can get more government funding. The journals obviously want to churn out more journal copies and get more papers out there. So to show, you know, we're making more journals, we sell more subscriptions. Obviously, that's their model. That's what the journals do. And the professors, of course, also want to get more journals. And then there's no opportunity cost for it because ultimately the person paying is the money printer at the helm, which is paying the universities and paying the journals and paying the professors. And the people who are handling all of that payment don't have an opportunity cost for the money that they um, hand out. And so therefore, we have this broken incentive model where since there's no opportunity cost, there's no corrective on just how much garbage gets produced. So we're constantly churning out mountains upon mountains of academic research papers that are just getting out there and making ticking boxes for professors to get promoted and for universities to get more research funding and for academic journal mafia to continue to get richer. And so you look at all of these examples and you see the same thing uh, repeating in a lot of things that are related to fiat. And, and in healthcare is another example here. So here we see a similar dynamic to, a point, to an extent where insurance companies, yes, they are the ones paying for your healthcare, but the more that your healthcare costs, the more they can charge you for your insurance premium. And since a lot of healthcare is provided by government in one form or the other, and since there's a lot of money to, be, to go around, they have an incentive in raising the prices. And of course, the healthcare providers, you know, the hospitals uh, also have an incentive to raise the prices. And so we end up in this spiral where mm -hmm. um, nobody has to think of the opportunity cost. You know, the insurance companies aren't out there trying to make sure that, you know, th they're not calling a hospital and saying, why the hell are you charging this kid $5,000 for two stitches or $8,000 for a 15-minute procedure? You know, can't you cut corners? Can't you, well, not cut corners, but, you know, can't you cut costs? Can't you make this more efficiently? Um there's very little incentive for anybody to be cost uh, aware about any of this stuff. The two things on that one is, you know, hospitals are typically the largest employers in town. And so they have an incredible amount of, of power legislatively to um, protect the moat that they have, you know, in that in that town, in that in that community. You don't want to piss off, you know, big, big hospital systems or, you know, have them lay off because it's going to have a direct impact on their on their town. I mean, they've, these hospital systems have, you know, psyoped people into donating to them, you know, because it's for, you know, a new, you know, woman's wing in the hospital. Well, well guess what? It's not, they're not giving this service for free. Like they're, they're gouging you, you know, 
by providing services in this new woman's wing that you now just funded because you donated it to them. I mean, some of the, the, the largest philanthropic gifts that have been given have been given to hospitals. And what do they do? They use that money to then go and charge people an egregious amount of, of money. You know, the, the other thing on that too, and you and I talked a little bit about this when we sat down at your place was these, th there's an interesting law, it's called a con law. I, I think it's it's interesting that it's called a con law. It's actually cert certificate of need, but we call them con laws. Put the con in con. Basically. Yeah, put the con in con. And it basically <laughs> says in 34 states that you need regulatory approval to build a new healthcare facility. So you have to go through the state, they have to approve it. And so, you know, I can have a $50 million and if I want to put up a new surgery center, I can't do that in 34 states because a regulator, a regulator has to approve that. And in essence, what happen, happens is that these big hospital systems don't want more hospitals um, unless it's owned by them in that community. So a surgery center, which is typically an outpatient surgery center, has a cost structure that's about a third to a half of uh, of what a hospital is. So it can offer services significantly at a significant lower price. Those, those get kiboshed by regulators because these hospitals come in and use a bureaucratic system to um, keep new facilities from popping up and therefore creating, you know, uh, uh, and oftentimes a monopoly, a lot of times a duopoly or an oligopoly in these these towns, and there therefore there is there is really no price pressure amongst the, the the hospitals. So you know, Wisconsin is a perfect example. It's probably the one of the most expensive places on the planet to get healthcare because they actually have a rule where they put a moratorium on new health facilities being built. And so what these what's happened is we had a couple health systems go in and buy pretty much everything in that state and then just jack up prices. I mean it it is a an, an egregious use of of monopolistic power. I'll give one this one example in Wisconsin is we had a member who had a comprehensive metabolic panel that I got here in Texas for five bucks, um, it, which means it probably costs two bucks, and they charge two hundred eighty-five dollars for it at the the hospital in in Wisconsin. So that's you know fifty-five times what I paid for it here in 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 Texas. So th this stuff is happening all over the all over the country, and and crowd health has kind of been created to you know get rid of some of those inefficiencies yeah i think this is a very very important point which is um it's a very common tactic among all kind of monopolies which is uh, the idea that well we're not going to get people to invest in this business unless we can guarantee to them that they're not going to face egregiously high competition uh, that could then undercut their investment and so in order to encourage investment in this industry we're going to stop people from investing in order to <laughs> ensure that the existing incumbents um, get their money back. And it's just, this is the sort of thing that gets taught in economics textbook as good public policy that if you wanted, and particularly in economic development in developing countries. So I remember I used to uh, study this and the, teach it as well in economic textbooks that, mm -hmm. well, um, you know, uh, hospitals have no incentive to make large investments in poor countries if one day they're going to wake up and find that there's another hospital that has uh, set up shop next to them. Because why would I say invest $10 million in building a hospital? Because then another hospital might show up next door and then they take our customers and then we can't make our money back. And so in order to encourage investment, we need to ban investment. <laughs> that's the that's the circular, uh, silly fiat logic, which uh, is very common in development economics. It's not just for hospitals; it's true also for industrialization, and it's basically just another excuse for um, uh, corporatism. It's another excuse for government to um, let people do what they want. You know, let large corporations have monopolies. So it's always promoted with the idea that without this. We wouldn't be able to um, get the investment. But in reality, what you're doing is that you're stopping others from investing. And so, yeah, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't be investing $50 million in this town for a hospital. If you need to invest 50 million, if you need to ban others from investing in order for you to put in the $50 million, well, 
Maybe you shouldn't put in the 50 million. Maybe you should put in 10. And then somebody else puts in 10. And then we have two hospitals competing with one another. And that's a much more efficient situation than having one giant mega hospital that is essentially uh, parasitic on society because, hey, we need to make our $50 million back. And you know, we're going we're gonna to need you guys to get sick a lot more. And we're going to need to start overcharging you because, uh, because otherwise you couldn't get a hospital. No. Otherwise, all these people you banned from investing would have built cheap alternative hospitals. And uh, the key thing here, of course, is that, I mean, in, in, in the statist fiat economist mind, the idea is, oh, well, you know, you need a hospital that costs $50 million. But in a dynamic Austrian economics, um, entrepreneurial uh, way of thinking of the world, no, maybe we don't need a $50 million hospital. Maybe we need three hospitals that are $5 million each. And one hospital is, you know, when you have these when, when you have competitive pressure on each one of them, then each one of them is forced to focus on their competitive advantage and forced to focus on how to make the process cheaper. So one hospital will be focused on, say, specific kinds of surgeries. One other will be focused on emergencies. Another will be focused on um, obstetrics and birth and child uh, pediatrics and so on. So by focusing on these kind of advantages rather than building a giant uh, megalithic one structure, then uh, you can get these improvements and efficiencies, which you can't get once you're providing these uh, giant corporations with these protections from competition, because then they have no incentive to stop competing. And this is, this is I think, a very major point here that uh, why would you want to compete um, when you can just lobby to prevent your consumers from, uh, your competitors from uh, joining? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, hospitals are some of the, you know, worst run entities probably in our country. Um, they are massively inefficient. And those inefficiencies are most obvious in our, our monthly premiums, given that uh, the majority of our healthcare dollars go to hospitals or, or hospital systems. You know, everybody wants to point at doctors. Oh, doctors make too much money. Well, you know, there's about a million doctors in the United States. They they make on average about 290 grand. So you know, put in some some benefits on on top of that four trillion dollar healthcare market. It's only like eight percent. I know we like to to diss on on the pharmas. I think they're easily dissable, right? But like it's that that's about three to four hundred billion dollars worth of spend. That's that's ten percent. And so it's it's not the pharmas or the doctors. Although the pharma should be three percent, don't get me wrong. It should shouldn't be ten. It should be like three. It's it's primarily these big hospital systems who are gouging um, health plans, and health plans are going along with it because they have really very little incentive to um, to negotiate prices down, and and that's the big challenges that we have in our in our system. You don't you see these big huge hospital bills from hospitals. They're very rarely coming from any, any other place. They're coming from the hospitals. If you look at all the, the headlines of egregious bills, they're all ER bills or, or things like that. And so, you know, the, that's where the most of the inefficiencies lie is in our hospital systems. And so if you eliminate the ability to have a surgery center, which has, you know, half or a third of the cost structure as a hospital, therefore th those, those prices will stay up in that, in that market. Just a real quick example, uh, we had a, a woman tear her ACL in Austin playing pickleball of all things. Um, and I, she went to the orthopedic surgeon. She wanted to do the surgery at the local hospital and it was like 22 grand or something like that. We said, Hey, would you do it at the surgery center? That's like a, a mile and a half down the road. And that was going to be 12 grand. So, you know, we literally was then like a mile or two save $10,000 because we took it out of the hospital, put it into an outpatient surgery center. It's a better experience. The outcomes are better. There's less likelihood that you're going to catch something while you're in the, in the hospital and, you know, complications are much, much lower. And so, you know, these hospitals, while everybody's looking at, you know, these, the news flash or like these hospitals going under and going bankrupt, I actually think it's the first step in revolutionizing healthcare is to see some of these big hospitals, you know, go belly up because I think they need to, they need to restructure, they need to figure out how to be way more efficient because right now they haven't had any need to because the insurance companies just pay whatever they, they, they want them to pay. You know, there's a New York Times article back, I think it was in March, that was like, they walked a consult, they asked a, um, a, in a hospital administrator, how much was it, how much is it for a total knee replacement? 
and they they thought it was something like thirty thousand dollars, and they had a I think it was a McKinsey consultant like literally walk you know, with the doctor and the anesthesiology, you know, everybody kind of through the process and then did some analysis. And it was like $3,000. Like they weren't even close. This is the only service that has no idea what their cost of goods sold is. They don't have a clue how much it costs them to, to, uh, to give birth to a baby or to do a knee replacement. And if, if you have a business model, which you'd have no idea what your cost of goods sold, that's a bad business model and should go under. So, you know, I, I think that it's not a, it's not a, a horrible things that some of these hospital systems are having some financial difficulties. Cause I think they need to, to, to really restructure the way that we, we provide services within these huge monstrosities. Absolutely. And I think, uh, yeah, this, this was, uh, I've mentioned this story a couple of times before on this podcast, but this was really my kind of big wake up moment on understanding just how absurd the system is. It was in 2008 when I had to get ankle surgery and I had a very simple question to the doctor's office, which is how much is this going to cost? Yes, I know I have insurance, but, um, you know, I keep hearing that there are other costs that the insurance doesn't cover everything. So can you just tell me how much this would cost? And they looked at me like I was some alien. What do you mean? How much does it cost? Why are you asking us? Why am I asking you? Because you're the ones that are giving me the surgery. Shouldn't you know? And they said, no, talk to your insurance company. So I talked to the insurance company. They they also spoke to me like I was an alien. You know, what do you mean? How much is it going to cost? It's going to go through the magic. It's like, why should you care? You're not even paying yeah. for it. Why should you care? <laughs> well, I am paying for it, but you know, it's like, exactly. hey. That's what they you, would you, say, though. How, how dare you ask? You know, we're, it, it's going to go through the giant Rube Goldberg machine of infinite wisdom of the healthcare system. And you're going to come out with an answer to it at the end. That's just how it works. And... Uh, it's it, it, it was really shocking because they can't, nobody really knows what the answer is. It's just an enormously complex system with so much bureaucracy, so much regulations and red tape that it's not possible for people to just give you an honest, straightforward answer about what's actually going on. It has to go through all of these complex uh, processes. And then, you know, uh, on the other side, you come out with a sort of vague answer about what it is that uh, you're going to be paying and then of course like th th there isn't one number the bills just kept coming in so they gave me an estimate and then the bills kept coming in and the final tally was about 10 times the estimate of what they had given me they told me somewhere between 300 to 500 dollars is what you're going to be paying and then it ended up being closer to about three thousand uh, dollars when you count in all the bills that just kept coming in because so many different people get to bill and so many different things uh, get counted that no single Single authority knows what the cost is going to be and it's just uh, you know people people who continue to say this is a free market healthcare system uh, this is um, this is a question you need to ask yourself like where else in a free market do you get this kind of treatment you know imagine going to a restaurant and just getting a menu with no prices and then you ask the waiter uh, how much am I, or how much is the burger and they tell you well we're gonna see you know just order it and then after you eat it, we'll uh, you'll get we'll the bill. We'll let you know. We'll let you know. Yeah, after you you have to eat it first before we can give you the bill. We can't give you the bill before you eat it. You know, and uh, it's just nothing like that. Uh, there's nothing like that in a free market. And the only reason, well, not the only reason, but the, the complex web of reasons why this exists in the healthcare system is because it's not a market. It's a heavily uh, regulated, heavily bureaucratized fiat institution where everything is decided from top down and everybody is trying to tick the boxes of um, answering to regulators and figuring out what they need in, in order to basically play the rules of the system in a way that is profitable for them. And so because of this, there's just so much leeway for people to continue to increase the prices, for people to continue to mess with the costs and increase them for you. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can build buildings that are dozens of stories tall that is one of a kind that has never been done before yet someone can tell me within a pretty tight range how much that building is going to cost to build yet if i have a colonoscopy which is a commodity service that has been done millions millions and millions of times um nobody can tell me what that costs right i mean it's just it's an absurd um system in which we 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 operate and, you know sailor 
recently tweeted, it's like, look, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Um, and I think that's very, you know, appropriate for, for, for healthcare, right? Um, this, this system has been built between big health insurance companies and big hospital systems with, you know, us not really having a, a say in, in how that looks. And that's why it's so dang complex is because people weren't thinking about, you know, us and, um, and how, how we react to it. So I, I joke, like there's two things I hate getting in the bill or in the mail. Um, one is my property tax. I live in Texas, property taxes suck here. Um, and they, they, you know, have no rhyme or reason why your property taxes go up. They just do. Um, and the second is a healthcare bill because you just don't know. I don't know if it's $2, $200 or $2,000. Like I, the over under of these healthcare bills are nearly impossible to predict. And it's just so complex because we are the product ultimately, right? Like we are being used as the product of, of healthcare and it's the health insurance companies and the hospital systems that are profiting off of us. Absolutely. I think the other aspect of it is that healthcare is one of these emotionally sensitive and um, emotionally important goods where people just suspend rational beliefs. And so like you look at your laptop, you know, your laptop keeps getting better, better every year. It's faster. It's got more memory and it keeps getting cheaper. You know, you look at compare the laptop today to the laptop 10 years ago. It's better performance at a lower price. Why does that happen in the laptop industry? There's no government body out there, uh, you know, putting a gun to <laughs> Tim Cook's uh, head and telling him we need you to make sure that your cost goes down. There's no government body out there banning people from making new laptops or making new microchips or making new software that improves the performance of laptops. Everybody's out there free to compete. Apple doesn't go around saying, hey, we need to a moratorium on others uh, producing computers so that we don't get new investment in the uh, in the computer industry so that we can uh, invest you know we need to ban uh, any new competitor from entering this market we don't have all of those things all of these things that you want to ha that people think should exist in the case of healthcare because healthcare is just emotionally pressing they don't exist in the case of computers and yet computers continue to get better and in the statist mind they think, well, computers get better because, you know, computers are not important. It's just uh, who cares if your computer crashes, uh, but human bodies are more important and, you know, we can't tolerate any kind of failure. So we need this kind of uh, oversight. Well, no, uh, computers are much more reliable and they continue to get more and more reliable every day because of the fact that nobody is forced to use any computer because the only way that Apple or Dell or Lenovo can get you to use their computer is that they need to convince you of it and that you have other choices. And so they need to continue to make their computers better and they need to continue to cater to different needs and they continue to specialize in different ways of making uh, things to improve the quality of it. And that competition is what gives us good and reliable products. You don't have that in healthcare because people are emotionally fixated on the idea that healthcare is just so different and so emotionally important for us that we can't let the market run wild because the market just means bad things. And as a result, we end up with this um, monstrous uh, structure, which then in turn, and this is the, the, the mental virus then in turn used to justify more and more regulations like look see how expensive it is to get two stitches for a kid that's what happens when you have a free market then we need more and more regulation we need more and more uh, government control over the healthcare system and that's going to bring the prices down somehow because it's worked so well over the last 50 years yeah, I mean, using the laptop example, right? If your laptop was free and somebody else was paying for it, then you would get the absolute nicest Apple computer that you can get, which is what thirty five hundred or four thousand dollars, <laughs> as opposed to getting the you know twelve or third thirteen hundred dollar you know Apple Air or whatever it's called, right? Like we will feel like we are um, entitled to the highest level of whatever we're asking for, and you know that's one of the problems with healthcare is. You know, once you get into the system, you want to suck as much value out of that system because you feel like you're entitled to it. 
And, you know, how dare you say that I can't do X, Y, and Z because this is my body and you don't mean you don't, you don't care for me. And, you know, it comes into this emotional component of this where you end up providing way too much, you know, care to some of these folks because they're entitled to having it, um, which is, you know, which is a problem. I, I mean, I said before, consumption is, is not the primary problem I, when compared to other countries there can be significant improvements here because we still have an overuse of labs and overuse of imaging and overuse of some of these procedures and overuse of prescriptions that are just a product of, you know, we're not paying for it. So let's consume as much of it as we, as we absolutely can. Um, especially since we're getting screwed. We feel like we're getting screwed by the system. If we feel like we're getting screwed by the system, we're trying to try to suck as much value out of that system as, as possible. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I think a very important point you made is obesity, which is uh, the, the unspoken part of this uh, mess, which people don't like to talk about in the US. But it is truly a, a, a catastrophe. It's, it's, it's a problem of enormous proportions, and it's uh, continuously getting worse and worse. And I mean, the US is really the world leader in this. Like uh, 40%. I, 40% of us are obese. Um, since 1970, we've gone from 1% of our population having diabetes to 8% of our population having diabetes. And that's m very correlated with, with, you know, obesity levels. And, you know, so I think the question becomes like, you know, why is that, right? Why are we just, we, we were average in the 1970s and now we're twice at the average basically from obesity. And I think that, you know, it's uh, lack of education, it's government intervention, all of these things are are leading us to, um, you know, have these healthcare costs that are twice as much. I mean, like I said er, earlier on, obesity is um, we are we are they 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 consume two to three times as much uh, healthcare. And if you if you norm normalize uh, obesity back to kind of what the average is in other developed countries, there's somewhere between six hundred and eight hundred billion dollars there that we would get rid of in our healthcare system, which would go a long way of alleviating our healthcare pressures. And so, you know, that's the, that's the challenges that we we have. And you hit it hard in in your book, right on on fiat food of why why this is happening. Um, and, and so, you know, it just kind of starts with the, the stupid food pyramid, which, you know, has been around for what, 60 or 70 years or something like, that. I mean, it's, it's been, been, been around for a long time. That's trying to teach us that this, this crap should be the basis of our, of our, you know, health. Whereas, you know, animal proteins and high fat animal proteins are, you know, should be have just a little bit of that. And so in essence, I think what you've said before in the, in the, in podcasts is like flip it upside down, like <laughs> is, is in reality where it, where it should be. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a massive problem for us as a country. Yeah. And I mean, in the fiat standard, I make the case that, um, this can't be understood outside of the context of the, uh, destruction of the U.S. dollar, and it's um, because on the one hand, the destruction of the U.S. dollar is what finances this enormous scientific uh, malpractice that is modern nutrition science, which is truly a crime of epic proportions. That's going around telling people to eat garbage, and that's only possible because of the destruction of currency. But I think even more um, tellingly, the smoking gun here is the fact that. The inflation is what destroys people's ability to afford the f nutritious, healthy foods that they need. And then that gives government an enormous incentive to go out there and to find a way to try and convince them that, hey, no, actually, you don't need the food that all of your ancestors have eaten for thousands of years. You need to eat cheap industrial waste. <laughs> and here's our inflation-funded scientist are here to explain to you why cheap industrial waste and leftovers from the production of engine lubricant are actually <laughs> the ultimate uh, and, and healthiest food for you. I think you can't you you can't understand the growth of obesity without that, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen this enormous growth since since the 1970s. It's no coincidence that this has come about as nutrition science has shifted to its idiotic criminal message of keep eating more grains and keep eating more uh, sugars and uh, don't worry about uh, reduce your animal fats and reduce your animal proteins and try and shift from animal proteins to plant proteins. It's no coincidence that this has come about at the time of this massive increase in obesity. And in fact, as I show in the fiat standard, you know, this corresponds to the changes in diet. Um, Americans are eating less red meat and they're eating more 
grains and more sugars and more of these things over the past 50 years. And as a result, they keep getting um, fatter and fatter and fatter. But the other aspect, which I think you mentioned, and this is where uh, crowd health's approach, I think, is really encouraging, is that, well, since the healthcare industry is so devoid of proper market incentives and it's so disconnected from real market feedback, it's truly astonishing that there's very little emphasis or zero emphasis from within the insurance industry or from within the healthcare industry to try and pressure people's uh, behavior away from things that encourage obesity. You would think in a free market, if I'm an insurance company and I'm out there insuring people, you know, I'm trying to get people's medical bills as low as possible. And so I have a very strong interest in figuring out how do I keep people healthy and how do I keep them out of the hospital, right? And so, you know, just like with uh, car drivers, car insurance, um, you know, if you're if you're a reckless driver and if you continue to get into accidents, your insurance premium goes up because the car insurance company expects, well, you've got it into an accident before and you've been driving recklessly before and you drove drunk a couple of times. Well, if we're going to take you on, we're going to charge you a higher rate because there's a higher likelihood that we're going to be paying more money to cover your um, driving in the future. But you don't see that in healthcare. You don't see health insurance companies telling people to um, eat properly. You see very, very little. If uh, I haven't heard of any insurance company that does this. You can't. US. Regulatorily, you can't. You cannot you know, charge them differently based upon their behaviors. Yeah, and that's just insane. I mean, you're charging drug addicts and alcoholics and people who are obese who are almost certainly going to have a much higher cost per average uh, than average for their health care. You can't charge them a different rate. And and this is why Murray Rothbard says, I think, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it says, if the insurer cannot um, discriminate essentially based on uh, criteria of the, that affect the outcome, if they can't charge different rates, then this is not really insurance. This is just a subsidy for ill health. You know, you're asking people who are healthy to pay to f- subsidize people to take um, unhealthy decisions. You're subsidizing alcoholism, you're subsidizing drug use, you're subsidizing sloth, you're subsidizing eating garbage because you're telling everybody, doesn't matter, you could be an alcoholic drug user who's obese and doesn't ever work out and has never been able to say no to um, a Dorito. And you're still going to pay the same thing for healthcare as the person who gets up every morning and does a workout every morning and spends all day, every day, turning down Doritos and cheesecakes and all of these many, many, many highly addictive temptations of modern food that it requires an enormous amount of willpower to be able to say no to those things. And then you you, you punish that person by charging them the same rate as the person who doesn't have that. So you're really making it very, very uh, lucrative uh, to just... Uh, take the path of uh, sloth and self-indulgence. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, you hit it on the, hit it on the head. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, our, our average customer at crowd health is 34. The BMI is four to five points lower than the, than the national average. And so, you know, we've got a group of people here who, who do take care of themselves, do realize the fact that somewhere between 70 and 80% of chronic conditions are preventable. You know, there are there are 20 or 30 percent that aren't preventable. It's just, you know, you got the raw end of the deal. But the vast majority of these are preventable, you know, and you can you go and you say, hey, listen, the vast majority of type two diabetics can actually cure themselves with the right diet. And people look at you like you're you're a crazy person. Um, the vast majority and 99 percent or more of the folks who are obese, if they change their behavior they will have a significant enhancement of metabolic function as a result of that and therefore will live longer and will have less healthcare costs. Um, People, these same people realize that, you know, if you look at all the stats, all the outcomes for the American healthcare system, they look terrible in terms of, um, you know, at lifespan and, and things like that. But most of those are personal decisions that people are making that are significantly reducing their lifespan as opposed to, the healthcare system. So if you are obese, you're somewhere between five and 15 years, you take five and 15 years off of your lifespan. 
you know, we have these incredible doctors in the United States, but if you're a hundred pounds overweight, like there's only so much you can do. Like they're not, they're not magicians. Right. Um, and so you are going to have more chronic conditions as a result of that. And so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, unfortunately in our culture, we have a high time preference, you know, culture where it's like, I, I want to, you know, eat now and don't worry about it. And, you know, we'll worry about the worry about the, uh, all the, the side effects of this later. Right. Um, and I don't, I think those people should pay something different than others who are saying, I'm going to sacrifice now because my long-term health, my ability to hang out with my kids, my ability to hang out with my grandkids, like all of these things are impacted by that. And so they have a low time preference, you know, uh, attitude towards life. And I feel like those people should be paying less because they are making those sacrifices. So, you know, in essence, kind of, that's what we're doing with, with crowd health is we've got a lot of people who are, you know, low time preference people who are willing to make short term sacrifices for long term gain, man, as such, they're saving a ton of money doing it. Yeah. And so you kind of get around that uh, specification of uh, discriminating uh, based on health status by basically not taking people above a certain BMI. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a, it's a, we have a weight limit and then we also have a smoking thing too, right? So if you decided that you're going to smoke and look again, it's if you smoke, you're, your costs are two or three, three X, what it is of a, of a non-smoker. So the two limitations we have are a weight limitation and a smoking limitation. And so you will, you will get a group of people who are by far not overweight and are non-smokers. And therefore it's a, it's a group of, of pretty healthy folks. Yeah. And I think this is really a third of the battle won because that's just going to, uh, it, it, it's a very Pareto kind of distribution situation where if you just get rid of the 20% that are going to be making the bills the highest, you've massively uh, you, you've massively reduced your costs yeah. by just doing that. And it's actually like a five. I think it's something like five and 80. It's like the top 5% or 80% of the expenses or something crazy like that. And so oh, wow. it's, it's even worse. Um, and so, you know, we will get of the five, four are behavioral, you know, they're preventative, you know, one is, is probably not preventative one to 2% are not preventative. And so we will still have that chunk. And we have cancer cases now that we're taking care of. We have really bad accidents that we're taking care of, but um, you know, the vast majority of these are, are injuries as opposed to illnesses, given that we have a lot of people in their mid thirties and we don't have, have many age restrictions other than, you know, Medicare restrictions. So, um, we just get a, kind of a self-selecting group of people who are in their 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 low to mid thirties. So we get a lot of injuries, um, a lot of ACL tears, and we just had one that was a, a bike, a horrific bike accident, and so things like that. Yeah, and I think it's just uh, in a free market. I think insurance companies, I would bet on them to figure out healthcare outcomes much better than. Even hospitals and uh, and scientists and nutritionists, because I think you know they have a very strong interest in keeping costs down, and I'd imagine they'd be able to mine the data to know very well. You know, they'd be able to look at your um, you know now with all of the tracking technology going around. Think about if insurance companies could set their rates as they'd want. You know, they'd be able to look at your supermarket bill and they, they, they don't need to start from any preconceived notions of what nutrition science says. They'll just see that, look at people's groceries and there's a very clear correlation. I'm sure you would find that. You know, there's a very clear correlation between uh, how much um, soda you drink, how much uh, confectionaries you eat and your uh, medical bills. Or on the other hand, there's a very negative correlation between how much red meat you eat and your medical bills. And I believe they'd be able to come out with very, very, very precise uh, estimates of what are the things that you should do in order to improve your health and what are the things that you should not do. And uh, that would encourage them to tell people to eat in a certain way, behave in a certain way so that they would get lower and lower premiums. But all of that is completely... Um, destroyed in this kind of heavily regulated fiat industry. Yeah, for sure. And and look, the 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 people who are on the outside of the uh of the grocery store, you know, it's the farmers, it's the ranchers, it's these folks that have very little power when compared to, you know, the Coca-Colas and, you know, the, the those those types of organizations, huge massive multinational corporations who 
you know, are paying the lobbyists and and paying, you know, for for campaigns and and things like that. So they got a an extraordinary amount of power in this country, unfortunately. And so the fact that you know, these health insurance plans um, could significantly, you know, change the way that the pricing model works based upon what you eat, which I, th- I agree with you is, is highly correlated to your costs. They can't do that because we have all these powers that be that say, oh, well, you know, people are going to start buying less Coca-Cola and Frito-Lays and Doritos and, you know, uh, Cheerios or whatever. Right. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the challenge that we, we have here, I think, in this, I mean, I think it's the, the, the food companies who are feeding us crap, who are the ones that are saying, no way, we're, you're not going to do this because you're going to eat less free delays. <laughs> yeah. And that's of course, you know, a lot of money uh, in both of these industries, the healthcare and the, um, food industry, a lot of money depends on you continuing to eat garbage and getting sick. Yeah. Feeds a lot of it feeds a lot of mouths, right? It feeds a lot of mouths, a lot of crap. I mean, look, if if the more crap you eat, the more you know mouths it's feeding with you know crap. Basically, is what's it's what it's what's happening, and so it's hard to change an industry that's feeding a lot of people, right? It's um, healthcare is, is a four trillion dollar industry in the United States. It's the biggest industry probably in the history of the world, right? I mean, it's if if uh, you know, I don't know if there's another GDP. If if healthcare was a G, you know, a, com- a country, um, I'm not sure there's a, another country that has you know a GDP you know higher than that, other than maybe a couple. Um, and so, you know, it's it's very difficult to change that much, uh, that big of an industry. But we're giving it giving it a swing. It's a David versus Goliath thing. But I think um, you know we we've, we've got a shot at it. Yeah, so now let's talk more about uh, crowd health. Tell us uh, what you are go- you guys are doing to try and change this. So how is h- how is your approach different? Yeah, so there's there's some things here that's um, you know, so health insurance, right? You you pay your premium um, and that and he- the health insurance plan holds it in a big pool of of fiat which as we all know is is melting day by day by day. Then they, you know, the way that they make their money is they've got premiums and then they have claims. And then the difference in between is is their profit. So you actually have them incentivized to raise premiums and incentivized to reduce claims, you know, in terms of, you know, saying no to claims, right? So they've got all kinds of perverse incentives that lead to higher costs and more more, um, of these claims getting denied. And as I was doing doing research, healthcare.gov, which is where about 20 million Americans go and get their their healthcare. If you're not on your employer's plan, you're either uninsured or you get it from healthcare.gov or one of the individual marketplaces. About 20% of claims in those in those plans that are sold on healthcare.gov are denied. So you have a one out of five chance of getting denied if you go into the hospital and have a big event, you got a 20% chance. I was one of them. I was one of the one of the fives. Um, and mine was eight thousand dollars. And the problem with that is that 250,000 families who have health insurance are either getting their claim denied or their deductible is so high that it's putting them into bankruptcy. So 250,000 people last year went bankrupt due to a health event, even though they had health insurance, right? And that's a tragedy. Like the whole point of insurance is if you have a big event that it doesn't put you into financial distress. And I had to, I had to write an $8,000 check there aren't a lot of families in the United States, you know, it's probably less than 10% of families can write an $8,000 check without putting them into financial distress. Like that's a problem. So we've changed this totally on how we do it. So every month you'll, you'll pay 175 bucks. If you're a family of four or more, it's 695. You put that into an account. Um, the way that we make money is it's a subscription fee. So we take $40 of it. The, the, the remainder stays in there. It accumulates over time, <clears throat> excuse me. And if somebody, so if, if you know, safe has, a, you know, kid has stitches um, and he goes to the hospital and it's $5,000, what we, safe would call us and say, hey, I just got this bill, it's five grand. And so we would negotiate that on your behalf. And so we get that one down by probably 70%. So we probably get something closer to the $1,500 range for that because we would post negotiate it. And we can talk about why we can do that, but we would post negotiate it down to $1,500. Safe would pay $500. And then we would crowdfund the remaining $1,000 from the group of people in, in the community. And so far in this community, we have thousands of people who are sharing their bills. So 
we would ask 10 people to give safe a hundred bucks out of that account that they have. And that's been accumulating over a period of time. If they say yes, then a hundred dollars goes from their account to safe's account. And then eventually safe will have enough in his account to pay for that, you know, to write a check to that, um, to that hospital to pay for that, those, those stitches. So then the question is like, okay, why would, um, you know, anybody, you know, say yes to, to safe other than being a, you know, a fanboy of his on Twitter or whatever. Right. Well, when, when you ask for a health event, we give the people kind of two, um, two, two pieces of data about you. Um, we, we tell them how in your, your uh, last 10 or 20 or whatever, however many times you've been asked, how many times have you given to others? And so if SAFE had said yes, 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 yes to everybody, then you've been a good member of our community. And so people will give to you. If you say no, 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 then people probably won't give to you, right? And so there's this community component of this that like, look, if I have a bad neighbor, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to help him. If I have a good neighbor, I'm probably going to help him. And so we've had 12 or 1300 bills thus far that have done that. And um, everybody who's been a good neighbor has gotten their bills paid. The second thing we, we give you is, are you going to the Mayo Clinic for a flu? Did you allow us to negotiate it? And ultimately, is just just a good price? Like, are you paying a reasonable, fair price for this procedure? And so we will let people know that like, hey, yeah, Safe got a, a bill for five grand. Um, he let us negotiate it. So it's a great price. Um, and so that that incentivizes people to actually allow us to negotiate on their behalf. We do all the negotiating. We don't ask anybody else to negotiate. And so this um, this solves kind of that inability to to or the the insurance company's inability to to negotiate. So that's the way that it, it works. But we're solving the perverse incentive problem. We're solving the pricing problem. For bills over a thousand dollars, we're getting about seventy-two percent better pricing than what the health plans are getting. Seventy-two percent, which is just crazy. So, wh why is this seventy-two percent? I mean, it's, it's. I I think this is really uh, th this is like the low-hanging fruit here, which yeah. is, I think, at the at, at the uh, at the core of your business model, and it's also very telling about the dysfunctions of the medical system, wherein like you can't negotiate with apple you know we're using the example of phones right like i can't get you to call apple on my behalf and tell them hey um you know that two thousand dollar laptop could you give it to say for 500 bucks uh -huh. they won't do that most you know restaurants won't do that anything that's actually a real free market they've got a price and you know maybe they'll do some accommodation for certain cases but right nobody nobody has a 72 percent discount available uh with a phone call, really. Um, what's the secret to that? Why can you manage to get those prices down so significantly? Yeah, so it, it depends upon the situation, right? If if you go to an emergency room, um, they just give you a bill afterwards, right? They don't tell you what the bill is going to be. And so there's actually code law that says it's, it's a UCC 2-305, which basically says, if you provide a service and um, you don't give them a price beforehand, then they have to negotiate with them afterwards. And so what we do is we go in with, and oftentimes with attorneys, basically saying, hey, listen, you have to give us a fair price, fair and reasonable price for this. And a part of that is you have to tell us how much it costs you, right? Because that should be you know, the, the, the lowest level. We're not going to ask you for any less than that because you shouldn't lose money on that, but you need to tell us that. And so once we start asking those types of questions, people are like, we have no idea. It's going to cost us as much, you know, to get a McKinsey consultant in here to figure out how much it costs than, you know, then answer that that question. And so they're willing to negotiate with us. The other thing too is all of our members are uninsured. Like we we're not insurance. And so they're typically getting about nine cents on the dollar from people who are uninsured. So if we can give them 30 or 40 or 50 cents, like they're pretty fired up that um they get to they get that money and they get it, they get it quickly. So that's the first thing. The second is, you know, we get them money quickly as opposed to having to bill, you know, health insurance. And so the, there's kind of an estimate of about 30 to 35% of, of healthcare is an administrative cost in just the billing process. And so um, if you can get rid of that 30 to 35%, then we can pass those savings on. So kind of imagine, right? You go to a doctor and you say, hey, here's my, you know, my visa, you know, that has a, a, a friction of, a percent or two, 
versus having to have a biller in the back who makes sure all the records are correct, that has to build the insurance plan, that has to wait 90 to 120 days to get paid. And oftentimes they get rejected. So you have to do it again. And so there's this just tons of friction on the insurance side that they can get rid of if they're willing to give us a, a good price. The actual billing software that these, these doctors use takes somewhere between six and 10% right off the top. And so it's it's all of this friction in the administration, the bureaucracy of billing that you can suck out of the, the system, pass on to, to the end user by literally using a visa card or a check as opposed to having to bill the health insurance companies. The last component of this too is about 30% of the doctor's time is spent dealing with health insurance companies. So, you know, you have a health insurance company sitting on your shoulder telling you, you can do this, you can't do that, you can do this, you can't do that, right? So one that's super annoying, and especially if you're like really good at what you do, like you don't want a little parrot sitting on your shoulder telling you what you can do or can't do, right? Like imagine somebody sitting on your shoulder right now saying, safe, this is how to run your, your podcast, right? Like that would be irritating, annoying, and you want to get rid of them. And so you will pay to get rid of them. And in essence, you will give a discount so you don't have to deal with them. Plus, it's 30% of your time. So if I don't have to spend 30% of my time on insurance companies, I can actually use that time to spend with patients generating revenue. That's really expensive time, right? And so those are the things that we're sucking out of the system to uh, allow these these huge discounts. Yeah, I think this is this is really a key point, which is that the, the, the way that the current system works is that it just keeps adding. Every time you get away from, you add another layer of bureaucracy between the uh, consumer and the provider, whether it's in healthcare or in education or in any of these things, what you're doing is just adding enormous amounts of inefficiency that um, eat up on the productivity of the provider and then ultimately raise the costs and um, you know hurt the consumer and the uh, producer. Uh, both and, it's, of and it's all under consumer protection too. It's like, oh, we want to protect the consumer because we are we are daddy government. We want you to protect it because you don't know what's going on with your own, you know, healthcare or finances and things. It's like, no, in essence, what you're doing is you're building a bunch of bureaucracy that's costing me a bunch of money for next to nothing. And in essence, it's to, to create power for, you know, legislators yeah. and and other people who have nothing to do with my healthcare. My healthcare should be between me and my doctor value for value like i'm going to pay what you know what your value is and and not having to worry about all the bureaucracy that that's associated with that that's one of the i mean key components of 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 bitcoin right um and you know and the other then really other quickly the other big piece of this is these insurance plans are holding this money in fiat Right. And so that fiat is just with the inflationary environment that we are in is declining in value. And so not only do you have a systemic price issue within healthcare that's exacerbated by a money supply issue. And so these are multiplying on top of each other. And so what we are saying is like, instead of putting that once, so you put 175 into your account, we take 40 of it, 135 is left then 75% of that is held in Bitcoin. So instead of you holding money in fiat, you're actually holding money in, in Bitcoin, right? And instead of the insurance company getting the interest on that and the in, you know, investment income off of that, you're getting all of that. So if Bitcoin goes from whatever we're at today, 16.5 or 17 or whatever it is, to 250 or 500,000, you get 100% of that upside. So you get all of the upside of, of that, that Bitcoin. So it, it, it um, stabilizes your base, but plus you get the upside in terms of, of, of the kind of investment revenue that goes alongside that as opposed to the health insurance company. Yeah, and of course the uh, the other side of this is that you know for health insurance companies, they need to hire hedge funds. They need to become hedge funds basically in today's uh, yeah. world. As I always say, you know, you you have to in the fiat system, you have to earn your money twice. You have to earn it once when you earn it, and then you have to earn it again every single day by going to the fiat casinos and following all the world's central banks' monetary policies and all the geopolitics of the world and commodities markets. Mm -hmm. 
and agricultural markets and you know weather patterns and trying to formulate uh, a new allocation every morning to make sure that you don't get uh, uh, your money destroyed by inflation and so insurance companies if they in order to keep their uh, in order to keep your money safe they need to have basically hedge funds operating uh, which again is massively eating into your costs and is arguably not that efficient at uh, producing the money that you want them to produce and I think the the flip side of this is another aspect of things that uh, raises the cost is the fact that because of inflationary money, nobody has savings. And so as a result, like the original form of, of health insurance is money. Buying money is the, uh, holding money is the original <laughs> form of health insurance because that's what money is for. Money is for uncertainty. You know, the reason that you ju don't just spend all of your money or don't just buy durable goods with it is that you want to have something that's liquid because you don't know what you're going to be spending money on because you might get a good investment opportunity tomorrow. So it's good to have liquid money that you could deploy into that investment immediately. And you might have a catastrophe that hits you and then you need to deploy that money in order to alleviate that catastrophe. You need to get surgery or you need to, uh, you know, your house gets flooded and you need to rebuild or whatever. So that's, that's really what original insurance is. You accumulate money as a form of insurance against uncertainty. And now that money is uh, essentially broken because it's constantly leaking the value that you store in it, because of that, most people don't have the ability to handle, uh, you know, as you said, an $8,000 bill, which when you think about it, $8,000 is, you know, the cost of, uh, is less than half the cost of the average car, maybe less than a third of the cost of the average car. And so it's not that much money when compared to the amount of money that people generally spend on consumer goods. But because all of those consumer goods are bought with credit, you know, it's one thing to spend that money on a car that you pay off over five years. It's something completely different to expect to spend that money upfront on a one-time payment. And that's where most people today um, don't have that. I think I've, I've seen a study somewhere along the lines of a majority of Americans can't meet a $400 uh, emergency expense or something like that. So people don't have cash sitting around. They don't have the security and safety and insurance of a form of cash that they can trust that allows them... Um, that allows them, you know, financial security without having to um, get into massive amounts of debt. And so as a result of that, I think an important thing to keep in mind is that, you know, your $8,000 hospital bill or my $5,000 hospital bill, a big part of that cost is the fact that they know that out of every 10 of these bills, most likely there's going to be about four, five or six of the people who get billed that amount who are just not going to make it. You know, they're going to... Well, I, I know a lot of people here in the US will um, will offer a fake address and um, you know, fake name, fake address, and then you're just not going to collect. And then another uh, strategy is, oh, well, um, I gave you my real name and real address, but I'm broke, um, you know. Uh, I'll declare bankruptcy. And then you need to go to bankruptcy court and you'll get cents on the dollar. So a big part of the reason why they have to charge $5,000 is because they're not expecting, they know that not everybody's going to pay the $5,000. And so if everybody could pay, you know, that immediately takes away, I don't know, maybe a half of the cost. It would be 2500 if they knew that everybody could pay. And then it would be a lot less if they didn't have to deal with all of the uh, bureaucracy and insurance stuff that they have to deal with. And it would be a lot less if they had a free competition with other hospitals in their neighborhood where anybody could set up a hospital. You know, if somebody could set up a small little emergency room, which is very lean and optimized for dealing with these small little cuts and bruises. And they can, because they're just doing that and they're taking cash, they could have, you know, they could stitch up your kid for $200 instead of 5,000. And that hospital then would need to start thinking very hard about how do they cut costs and bring it down. So all along, we see all of these inefficiencies caused by essentially fiat healthcare. You know, healthcare impositions from above rather than relations that emerge between the provider and the consumer, between the patient and the doctor. All of these layers of inefficiency are what's driving this. And what's encouraging about your business model is that you're finding a way to cut at the heart of it with Bitcoin.
Yeah, with with Bitcoin. I mean, I, you know, a couple of things about what you said is, you know, this eight thousand dollars, right? It's it's a, a third of the car, but the car actually has utility. <laughs> you know, I can actually use that car to then go and generate potentially more more income. Whereas these these healthcare bills, like it's gone. Like you're 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 not creating any value out of that. All the value is captured by by the hospital. Um, and so, you know, the issue that I have with this is that, you know, I went to healthcare.gov just because I was curious, like, what can my family get? What does that that bill look like? And right now it's um, 11, the, 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 the quote I got was $1,100 a month and a $15,000 deductible, which means that, you know, I'm almost $30,000 in before the insurance company pays a dollar, <laughs> um, which is, you know, in- incredible. I mean, why would I, as somebody in my early 40s who's healthy, you know, I'm 6'2", 180, labs are good. You know, my LDL is high because I eat a lot of meat, but, um, you know, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm healthy. Why would I pay $30,000? Like the probability of me hitting that $30,000 mark is something like one in a 200 chance. So why would I pay $30,000 for a one in 200 chance? And especially since I'm subsidizing everybody else who is not 6'2 and 180 pounds, right? They're significantly different than that demographically. And so I think, again, that's the huge benefit from, uh, you know, for crowd health is, you know, you're, you're basically paying for what you get, like what you're using, um, which is a cool component of, of what we do. Yeah, that's, that's really uh, the key thing. So what do you see as the kind of, um, plan for you guys in five years time where do you see this going what are your goals moving forward um you know do you just want to keep uh, scaling the current business model or do you have ideas of you know doing other things or maybe expanding into healthcare provision or uh, building hospitals or something like that <laughs> i don't think we'll be building hospitals but i i do think that you know like the, the we have a, a kind of a two-part bitcoin strategy one being because we want that we look we we want crowd health to be um, a way to expand adoption of, of Bitcoin. Um, and the first way that we're doing this is is creating a decentralized Bitcoin pool, if 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 I can call it that. Although it's you know in thousands of accounts, it's not held in one account, and actually crowd health never touches that. It's all in the accounts of our our end users. And so that's one is just kind of stabilize that base. But two, it's can we use the, the the Bitcoin rails to continue to reduce the costs of of these transactions? Um, you know, right now it's 30, 35 percent. We can use a, a Visa card and it's a couple percent. I could use Lightning and it's a few pennies. And so can we expand the payment processing over over the Bitcoin rails um, to increase the 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 efficiency of, of doing that. So, you know, it's look, we have a four trillion industry. It's it's the biggest on the on the planet. If we can use or more widely adopt Bitcoin within healthcare, I think that goes a long way in, in doing what I think most of us want is just a, a wider expansion and adoption, ex, ex, you know, uh, accepting of of Bitcoin. So that's one of our our big goals over the next couple of years is to be able to do that. But you know, in essence, what we want to do is we have thousands of customers now. We'd like tens of thousands of customers, you know, next next year, and eventually leading to hundreds of thousands of customers. And if we can do this then I think we can ultimately transition our country from a government-run bureaucracy that's enabling large organizations to take advantage of us to more of a personalized healthcare system where it's between me and my doctor and I'm paying for what I'm actually, you know, using in the healthcare system. So, you know, that's our, our long-term goal is to tr- really try to, to bend that cost curve of, of healthcare by creating some consumerism and, and a real true like free market you know, system um, to the best we can. So, like I said, we're going up against United Healthcare. They're the seventh largest company in the in the world. You know, by revenue, Aetna I think is the the sixth largest. CVS Aetna is the sixth largest. So we're going up against some monsters. There's going to be some regulatory you know stuff that you know I, I know they're going to want to push on us. But you know, I do think we can really change the way that we we do healthcare. And by the way, we've done this for hundreds of years, like, you know, hundreds of years ago, like if somebody in our community got hurt, like the rest of the people in that community would gather around them to help them, right? It, there was an insurance company or the government in between them and their neighbors. And so that's what we're trying to do now is kind of bring back the way that it was to bring, you know, humanity back into healthcare. So it's not a big, cold corporation in between us and our neighbor. It's 
literally me giving directly to safe, you know, for his son's stitches um, because something, you know, crappy happened. Like that's, that's a great thing that we need to, we need to get that personal connection back and get the insurance companies and the government out from in the middle. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the, the, the best advertising I think for you is just going to be that uh, the, 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 the fiat healthcare system is just continuously be becoming less and less sustainable for uh, yeah. more and more people. Yeah. What about uh, doctors? Do you see a way for you to work with doctors to get them on board to, uh, you know, have, uh, I presume you're beginning to establish relationships with healthcare providers so that you can have a few go-to places where you know you'll get a good deal? Yeah. I mean, we, um, doctors love us. They're like, man, will you please send us more people because we would love an all cash system. I think I talked to your brother about it actually over, uh, over barbecue at, at Jimmy Song's house one, one day. And he's like, man, you know, if you could figure out a way to make this a cash system, that would be so incredible because the insurance companies try to rule all that we do. And if we had some autonomy over the care plan for our, our patients, that would make my job a lot easier, a lot more fulfilling. And we're seeing tons of burnout from doctors. So let's get the insurance company out from in between and, and pay in cash. And again, you kind of a value to value exchange. And you know, the, the doctors really, really love what we're doing. We're oh, by the way, we're all we're starting a medical advisory board too of just Bitcoiners. Um, so if you're a doc and you're a Bitcoiner, please reach out to us on on Twitter. You can DM me or you can DM, you know, join Crowd Health. And we're trying to put together a, a, an advisory board of of docs to help us really kind of navigate some of the the landmines out there but also to help some of our help some of our patients excellent excellent uh nathan you had a question uh yeah i first what you just said i, I wanted to comment i see a medical doctor and it's all cash and it really works great and uh he is a big time bitcoiner i will uh pass this on to him great um, my question, two questions. One is, uh, you mentioned you discriminate on age and smoking, which makes sense. Uh, are there any other selection criteria like age or pre-existing conditions and such? And then once you start, uh, are the contributions vested? Are they, what happens like if the person dies or decides they don't like the service and move on, what happens yeah. to the contribution amount? It's a great question. So, um, you know, the only, so if, if, if we, we serve up to 64 um, and then 65 and, and beyond is, is Medicare, not because we don't want to serve them, but legally we can't serve them. So if you are in Medicare or eligible for Medicare, there are many places in which doctors actually won't accept cash. So you can't accept cash when you can't, could accept Medicare. And so even if you aren't on Medicare, a lot of doctors will be like, uh -uh, I'm not taking cash from a Medicare patient. Again, it's a legislative thing. And so it makes our our um, our service non-viable for for Medicare um, aged folks. Um, and so the only other thing for pre-existing conditions, you can have whatever pre-existing condition you want. We just think it's fair that you own your own pre-existing condition for the first two years. So you can't have something you know, we kind of call it called it, you know, a health debt transfer. So you can't transfer any of your health debt stuff that you should have gotten, you know, taken care of onto the community. And so you have to own that stuff for the two years. And then in the third year, the community will help you with any pre existing condition, any pre existing conditions up to $25,000. And then for your second question was what happens with the money? When you leave, you get the money, it's yours. So that account is yours. And so, you know, we have customers that have five or $6,000 in them. So if they were to leave today, we would, they would liquidate their account and pay it out to their personal bank account. Um, so you get to take it with you. So it's actually, you know, your money. If you die, um, then we'll turn that over to your executor. And so we'll, we'll follow all the state rules for, for that. If you were to, to die, thank God we haven't had anybody die yet. Hope that run continues. Yeah. Well, it, it, the cool thing about this, right? Like, you you pay premiums into health insurance every every month, and those things just disappear, right? Like they go into the black hole of insurance land. You know where for us, like you're actually putting it into an account, and you get your account balance, and you know how much is in there, and it's yours when you when you leave. I mean, it's a totally different model, um, but it makes people think about it. it's like, oh wait, 
this is my money I'm spending. <laughs> and so there's a behavioral change there, especially within our Bitcoin community. Like we have a community where it's just Bitcoiners who will share. So anybody safe who uses your, your promo code, which is SAIF safe, will go into that Bitcoin community. You're actually sharing expenses with other Bitcoiners. Right. And so there's an extra incentive to kind of behaviorally do things that are not just good for you, but good for the good for the community. And I'll give you one quick example where I had to go get labs um, for my my just primary care annual visit. And so he gave me a list of 10 labs that I had to go get. And I was like, man, I'm just going to go across the street because it's you know right across the street. It's easy. So I priced it out and the labs were like four hundred and forty dollars. And so I called Crowd Health and I to my care advocate. Um, and I was talking to her and she's like, okay, well, let me see how much it is. And she found out it was $44 at a place that was like another mile down the street. So instead of going to the one that's like right next to my house, that was 440, I went to the one that was right down the street, which was like 44, 48 or something like that. But I did that behavioral change because I'm in a group of other Bitcoiners who I don't want to screw other Bitcoiners. I can go with the extra mile to save 400 bucks, right? Like that makes sense for me. If I was in health insurance land, like, there's absolutely zero incentive for me to go down the street, even though it's 400 bucks less because I'm not paying for anything, right? Um, so there's a behavioral change here too as a part of being in this community that I think is having a, a dramatic impact on, on, our, on our costs. Yeah, and I think another thing that I can think of here, which is wind in the sails of your cost reduction, is the fact that if you've got it to the point where you're, uh, you know, you've questioned the monetary system, and uh, you know, you look at Bitcoin Twitter, you know, uh, people get into Bitcoin Twitter because initially they're interested in Bitcoin as a technology, then they figure out how the money is broken, and then suddenly it's a, uh, it's an endless rabbit hole where you realize more and more and more things are broken, and they're broken because of the money. And then it's just, uh, it's 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 like uh, a spiral. <laughs> it's like your life. I'd like to call it your life spirals into control. Um, things just keep getting fixed. You know, you realize, oh, ah, this food that I'm eating is garbage. Maybe if I stopped eating it, things would be better. And then you start eating better, your health improves, and then your mental capacity improves, and your focus and your concentration improves, and then you start uh, thinking more long term about all kinds of different things and you witness this enormous improvement that we see in many bitcoiners and i think the um the, the interesting thing here is you you have a very positive sample selection bias in the people who are going to join this and i think that's very positive for your cost because you know the average um, fiat health insurance user is essentially completely unconcerned with their costs and they're mm -hmm. uh, they're completely divorced in terms of thinking of the consequences of their actions to their healthcare costs. The way that the healthcare insurance system works is it doesn't matter how healthy you are, you're still going to be paying the same insurance premium and you're still going to go through the same kind of nasty process if something bad happens to you, whether it is something that you brought on to yourself through years of bad habits and bad uh, decisions, or if it's just something that happened out of your control, you know, you needed to get your kid a couple of stitches because they slipped, um, you're still going through the same process and you don't see how you can uh, ameliorate this. You don't see the benefit from it. Whereas with Bitcoiners, you see this over and over that, you know, the, the, the joke goes that Bitcoiners just, you know, you, you, you join for the money and then suddenly it's, it's, it's a full self-improvement revolution where um, you start eating differently, you start uh, being more productive, you quit alcohol, you quit drugs, you quit all kinds of negative habits. I mean, it's, it's, it's an extremely common observance that you see among Bitcoiners. And on Twitter, people are always joking about it to the point now where, you know, it's no longer really a joke. Everybody recognizes that there is a strong element of truth to that. And I, in my work, you know, I explained that with time preference. The way that I look at it is that the hardness of your money is the control knob of your time preference. Uh, the more you are secure in the knowledge that your money is going to be there for you in the future, that nobody's going to devalue it, nobody's going to rug it from underneath you, nobody's going to destroy its value, the more you are likely to prioritize the future, the less you are likely to discount the future, the more you think of the future. And then that begins to reflect across all aspects of your life. So not only are you realizing why things are broken and why money destroys things in our modern world, but also you're beginning to realize that, hey, my future is less insecure than I thought it was. I'm able to provide for my future. 
I'm able to have a higher degree of certainty in my ability to save for the future. And then suddenly that just orients you toward becoming more uh, future oriented. You start thinking about starting a family, you start um, being able to commit to long-term goals, you start being able to work out, you start cutting down on your um, bad habits, you start investing your time in productive habits instead. And so if you're marketing to Bitcoiners, a product like uh, health insurance, it's not health insurance technically, but it's similar to health insurance. If you're marketing to Bitcoiners, you've got this enormous uh, cheat code, wherein these people are already, you know, they've considered why um, the money is broken, they realize why the money is so important. And they are much more future oriented they are much lower time preference than the average person. And so that's just going to hopefully make uh, the economics for your business much better over time. And we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing people that are, we just had a, a woman who's got, I think, ovarian cancer, um, who, you know, had to have a hysterectomy and she had a choice. She like, could go to the hospital down the street that was going to cost her $40,000 for a laparoscopic hysterectomy, or she could go to another hospital that we found that was going to do it for $9,000. And she went to the one that did it for $9,000, which is, you know, 75% plus um, less expensive than, than the one, you know, right down the street. And so again, with our health insurance system, we would have no incentive to do that. Um, if you're in a group of people who are all knowing that they're relying upon each other, then I think there's a much higher incentive. And plus that, like you said, there's, there's so many other ways that impacts our, our life. If like we reorient our lives to say, Hey, you know, what, what are we doing today? That's actually impacting other people. Um, and, and our decisions, our personal decisions are impacting others. Like, man, what a better world would we live in if it wasn't so much about us, um, but more about our community around us. And that's what we've gotten at crowd health is we kind of say, it's like, we put the humanity back in, in healthcare. Um, we had a woman a few weeks ago who got her hand stuck in a, the prop of a boat in Tennessee, 19 year old. And it was a huge bill, as you could probably imagine, severed four of her fingers. And um, we went around and we, we crowdfunded that one. And we actually had people come back and be like, hey, can I give more? Can I give more to that woman than you asked for? You know, because I was, I feel for her. Like, I, I want to help that family. Like, I couldn't imagine being 19 and having four of my fingers being severed. And so you would never do that with health insurance. Like, at, you know, ask your insurance company to pay more for, for, for something, right? Like, it's just not unheard of. But we're like bringing back this community where I was like, man, I care for other people in my community and their well-being. And it's like, what a beautiful thing that is. And I think we see that very much within the Bitcoin community. That's like, look, we could keep this to ourselves. Like Bitcoin is great, but like I'm, I'm two years into the Bitcoin thing. And one of the things I've realized is like, everybody is willing to help. Everybody's willing to give me tons of, of grace around like not knowing some things or saying, you know, maybe accidentally calling, you know, Bitcoin crypto, you know, in the very beginning, like, no, 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 it's not crypto. Let me tell you why. Right. Like, um, like being very graceful in some of those things. And it's like, man, like I love the community around Bitcoin. It's very, very powerful. Love kind of the, the sovereign individual component of this, but like we're all sovereign individuals within bigger communities. And the more sovereign we are as individual, I think the better community members we end up being, the more generous we are to people. And that's what I'm seeing within the Bitcoin community, which I think is, is you know, and that's why I think crowd health resonates with them. So it's a, it's a cool piece of what we do is having these Bitcoiners who are all sharing with each, with each other because we're seeing behavior change. Excellent, excellent. Um, anybody else have any more questions? Uh, Scott? Yeah, thank you. Um, just a question on, if I understood correctly, you take a percentage of the funds and that goes to uh, Bitcoin. Uh, how does custody work in that case? Uh, we have it with Swan right now. Um, okay. So, you know, it, it, it is, it's on a custodian. It's not, you know, it, it's the best we can do with, with how we're currently structured. And I think Swan and Corey and the entire team over there are, are well-respected and it's not like putting it on FTX. I think it's a whole different, um, whole different, you know, planet than, than FTX given who they are. And so we, I got to know them and, and I, I, my, my goal was to have self custody. We just couldn't figure out a way to do this within kind of our context. So we have it over at, at Swan. And again, it's, it's your name. It's your name on the account. You have full access to it. Okay. Um, it is is not in a crowd health account over there. It's it's actually in yours. So it's not a multi sig or it's just just in your name. Nope. Okay, it's in yours. Yep. 
Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Well, um, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. This has been uh, remarkably informative and happy uh, and really a promising and wonderful way to find a way out of this kind of uh, morass that is the uh, modern healthcare system. I wish you guys all the best in everything that you do. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll definitely stay updated over here at the podcast and we'll have you over another time uh, to discuss how things are going, hopefully with many more Bitcoiners signed up. I can't wait for your new book, Fiat Healthcare. So you just let me know when it's coming out or you need a co-writer. You just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to uh, to opine on that. So thank you for having me. And, you know, again, come see us, joincrowdhealth.com slash BTC or and use the promo code SAFE, S-A-I-F. It's 99 bucks a month for the first six months. You're going to be in a Bitcoin community. You'll be sharing with other Bitcoiners. It's a cool thing to be a part of. So thanks again, SAFE, for having me on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.